Why, hello, Teddy. Oh, oh, excuse me, sir. Sir? How many times have I told you not to hack the planet? Excuse me, sir? Are you Neo? How about I give you the finger? Why, hello again, endurance nerds. I believe the time for denial has finally come to a close. We can no longer ignore the nasty cold weather hitting us here in the Northern Hemisphere, and it doesn't matter how many real tears we cry, how often we bitch, or how many strongly worded letters that I might write to the Weather Channel. The weather is not going anywhere. Damn you, Weather Channel. Can't you just help us out? I'm not your dad, but I would get out. With programs like Zwift, Ruby, Trainer Road, all of those elements that can make for a more palatable indoor training experience, sometimes just getting outdoors is what we need to break up some of the monotony, keep our motivation high, get some of that fresh air. And if you use some good kit and some mindful layering, you can continue to enjoy some outdoor rides here and there, even throughout your winter season, and do so safely and comfortably. So in this video, I want to go through some of my key pieces of kit that I use throughout the colder portions of the season, so when I do want to ride outdoors, I can do so pretty comfortably. Now, I'm not going to share every piece of cold weather gear I own with you guys. We would literally be here all day, but rather share with you some key pieces that are representative of my collection. I have many pieces that I've collected over the years that are variations of similar equipment, might be slightly different insulation factors, a different cut, a different color, whatever that might be, but I'd like to show you a good cross-section of what I have and what I use those things for. My area, we have four full seasons, so a full spring, summer, fall, and winter. Our springs are cold and wet. Our summers can be hot and humid even up into the 90s. We have falls that tend to be cold and sometimes a little bit on the wet side, maybe even a little bit of snow during that time of the year. And then during the winter, we can get down even sub-zero and with quite a bit of snow. Now I'm going to share with you kind of three categories of equipment that I use. So let's jump right into the first category here, the lightweight category. This is going to cover your temperatures in the mid to upper 50s into the 60s. As such, it will be the smallest collection should come as no surprise as you will need the least amount of insulation and layers in that particular temperature range. And with all the categories, I'm just going to start from the top and work my way down just to keep things consistent. So to start in this category, I have gloves. Now, when it starts to get into the lower 60s and upper 50s, that's when I feel that bare hands or just traditional gloves just aren't going to cut it against the wind. So I will introduce a pair of wind resistant thin gloves. So I have two pairs here. The first is a pair of Pearl Azumis. These are again, very thin gloves give you a lot of dexterity here. They have some good grip here up along the top of the palm and in between the index finger and the thumb to give you good grip on the bars. Actually, it used to have a lot more pieces of grip here over the course of, I think the five years that I've owned these, these start to kind of come off. It is what it is after you've washed them a number of times, but these are great. I feel like they're just kind of a second skin. They do keep my hands quite warm. They also have kind of like a soft area here, you know, doing one of those things with the nose. Things get a little bit runny in that area. If it starts to get cold, don't blow your nose on your gloves. It's kind of gross, but this does offer a softer area so you don't get kind of all raw around the corners of the nose if you do start to get some of that post nasal drip there. The other pair I have here is a pair of Giro gloves. I think these are more of a glove liner. Again, I've had these for years. I think these came with another pair of gloves I will show you a little bit later. They have a lot of grip on the inside here. These would be great for mountain bikers because it gives you that kind of full hand grip. So if you have some of the flat bars, I don't know that I really need that for some Something like a road bike, but it's there. I get good grip. I don't feel like I am slipping off the bars at all. Again, just a typical type of glove, almost similar to a jersey type of material. Full dexterity, very flexible, just enough to cut that wind and keep my hands warm. Next up, I have arm warmers. I have probably a dozen different pairs of arm warmers. These are just kind of representative of the collection. One type I have is kind of a standard Lycra type of arm warmer, very breathable fabric. It just acts as kind of an extension of a typical short sleeve jersey. So if you don't have a long jersey, a pair of arm warmers can really do the trick for you. And I also have a pair of lightweight fleece lined arm warmers here. This one in particular, you can see kind of there's a, some fleece in there. And I like these ones because they are high vis and they have some reflective vinyl on here. So if you orient the reflective vinyl on your forearms, these are great if you're riding when it starts to get a little darker or early in the morning. If you're trying to indicate your turns as you should be on the road and the headlights of somebody's vehicle hits the side of this, they actually light up pretty bright. So these are great in terms of being seen. And and they are exceptionally warm for their thickness in terms of the fleece lining here. Next up, we have a vest here. 
This one's made by Castelli. My team has historically used Castelli gear, not sponsored, but if you do order a team quantity of these garments, you typically get some kind of a discount there. But there's nothing stunning about these vests, no particular bells or whistles or any type of specific technology. It's just kind of a windbreaker for your chest and for your torso. Keeps the wind away from your core, keeps your core nice and warm. A great transitional garment. Uh, it does not have pockets to make sure that it remains windproof through and through, even though not a lot of wind isn't really going to hit your back. Some vests do have pockets, but this one has some zips on the side so you can access your jersey pocket. I think the biggest thing for me, not wanting to have pockets in my vest, is if you want to take it off as things get warmer, you can roll it up and put it in your jersey pocket without having to kind of transfer things over, but it's really just a matter of preference. And these zips on the side can help you to kind of shed some heat too if you're starting to build up a little too much heat under the vest. I like this design quite a bit, but there are a number of great vests out there. Next up, and this is a piece of gear that I think you men in particular are really bad about using. Not all of you, but some of you act like a hard ass and go out there without a pair of knee warmers. Knee warmers are critical pieces of gear in that transitional portion of the season. You should be protecting the area around the knee and the lower portion of the leg, even when it's around room temperature outside, so 65 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. I know that kind of sounds ridiculous considering you might be wearing shorts just walking around outdoors in that type of weather, but it gets much colder on the skin and on the muscles as you're moving through air much faster. It could be 18, 20, 25 miles per hour. You should be protecting those muscles. There's a lot of science to indicate that that cold temperature is damaging your muscles. I'm not going to go into that science here. It would make this video entirely too long. Maybe that's a video for another time, but even if you don't feel like you're cold because they're much larger muscle groups or your legs are moving, you can still be damaging your muscles with colder temperatures. Cold is far more damaging and dangerous than being too hot. So don't be afraid and don't feel self-conscious about putting on a pair of knee warmers. It's going to protect your muscles and preserve your performance. I guarantee you wearing a knee warmer where the bottom portion of your leg is still exposed, it kind of heats up those larger muscle groups, heats up the blood that will be delivered to the extremities. You'll have enough venting capacity in the lower leg that you are not going to overheat just because you're wearing a knee warmer. Forget the embrocation, forget the HTFU, get a pair of knee warmers. These ones in particular that I use are a fleece lined one because I'm a little bit more sensitive to cold, but you could stick with a very basic Lycra model knee warmer, just enough to cut some of that cold air temperature away from the muscles and keep some of that heat inside of that knee warmer. Lastly, we can look at socks. There are different thicknesses of socks to be sure. I have a bunch of thin, mid-weight and heavyweight socks specific to cycling. Usually a mid-weight sock will do me just fine when the temperatures are between that upper 50s and into the 60s. But let me pause real quick and ask you guys to hit that thumbs up button. I had to make a huge mess pulling all this shit out there. So, you know, that was hard. Thumbs up or not, it's okay. Anyway, moving on. Moving into the mid-weight category, starting with the head, I will use something like a helmet liner. These are great lightweight types of hats. This is actually not specific to cycling. This is something I bought for skiing, but they're very thin, but usually insulated with something like a fleece so that you don't have something too obtrusive or too thick under your helmet. So if you don't have a ton of play with your ratcheting system in your helmet, something like a helmet liner can help to trap heat in just like a hat, but not be too thick underneath the helmet. I also have a buff here. I probably have a dozen of these, and I don't think I've paid for a single one. Usually they'll throw these things in free with purchase for something. If you do ever get them, keep them aside. They're very useful pieces of kit here. They're usually just kind of a tube of fabric, some kind of synthetic fabric that's generally breathable. And this is great and flexible. You can kind of pull it up over your head, kind of cover up the ears, acts as a helmet liner. You can wear it around the neck, like just a typical neck gaiter. And what I really like about them is however you wear it, when you have it around your neck or around your head, you can pull it up over your mouth. It's still very thin and breathable so that forced air will still come in and it won't obstruct your breathing even when you're working hard. But if you feel like you're getting a little bit too hot, you can pull it down. Maybe you're going uphill, you can kind of pull it down, let your face breathe a little bit and then pull it back up over if you need it. So you can kind of cover your chin. It's a very flexible piece of material you can use in a number of different ways. I use it for cycling, running, going out for a walk. It's very versatile, very inexpensive. In fact, most of you can probably make one of these on your own at home. If you have like an old t-shirt, I'd recommend something synthetic and not cotton. But again, you can kind of make your own out of whatever you have at home. Next up for the hands, I have a pair of thicker gloves. These are kind of a pair of crossover, kind of entry level winter gloves. These are more appropriate for the fall and spring, but they are much thicker than the gloves I showed you guys before. They are a full fingered glove here. You lose a little bit of dexterity when they're thicker, but I can move all my fingers very well. I'm very comfortable in terms of shifting. What you really just lose the most is kind of that tactile feedback that you get out of the thinner glove. You start to lose some of that sensation in your fingers, but it keeps your hands warm. 
Again, you kind of have that fabric strip here up on the top of the index finger and on the top of the hand, in case you need to do one of those. That way you're not making that nose nice and raw, right? There's a lot of grip here in the fingers up along the top of the palm and the base of the palm. This one in particular has a little bit of gel padding there. I can take or leave the padding. I don't particularly need it, but it does help to take up a little of that vibration, especially as the roads get a little bit more gritty in the winter time. I notice that it does help a little bit. And then it has this Velcro here, so you can cinch it up nice and tight around the wrist so that you don't have any sneaky wind getting inside underneath your glove. Next up, it's just another pair of arm warmers, but these are a thicker pair. These are very thick fleece. These keep my arms nice and warm. So if I'm moving more into that kind of transitional phase, or I can double these up with a layer I'll show you here in a second, but it's just a little bit more versatile than the traditional Lycra pair or the thin fleece pair that I showed you before. But I might put these on top of something like this. This is one of my favorite pieces of gear. This is an Under Armour cold weather mock turtleneck. This is not specific to cycling. You'll actually see a lot of football players wear these, but they're really great in terms of trapping heat inside, but also wicking enough so that you're not just turning into a complete sweat box. It's great for sport, again, synthetic material, but insulated enough that it blocks the wind and keeps the core and the arms nice and warm. This is great for underneath a vest, great for underneath just a traditional jersey. Again, you can put some arm warmers on top. This is where I start seeing that crossover effect. I might be able to combine this with the vest from the lightweight gear, and I start to make different collections or outfits, if you will, depending on the temperature, the wind, and the elements outdoors. I can't recommend these enough. I'm going to try to leave links for most of this stuff if I can find it down below. I've collected this stuff over the course of the years, so some of the stuff might be discontinued or replaced with a newer model. I'll do my best to find kind of versions of all the stuff, link it down below, so you can at least check them out to see if any of these can be good to add to your collection. Next up, we're going to be looking at the lower body here, and this is in terms of bib tights. I love bib tights. They are my favorite. I'm not a big fan of just a traditional short or tight. I like things that strap up over the shoulder. And the company that I really like in terms of bib tights is Gore Bike Wear. I like Gore because they are very good at cold weather gear and they are a great balance between durability, affordability, and performance. I like Castelli products a lot, but when it comes to some of this cold weather gear that I don't get as much use out of, there's no use for me in paying the premium price. So if I can get pretty close to premium performance for a much lesser price, I'd much rather stick with a brand like Gore Bike Wear to do that. Again, traditional tights here, just kind of to cut that wind. They're not completely windproof or waterproof. They're just meant to keep you warm and cover up the whole leg here. It's got a pretty standard chamois, just kind of a mid-weight chamois. I don't like a super thick chamois, so this is pretty much perfect for me. Not my favorite, but it's certainly comfortable enough to get through. They also have a feature here in the bib straps where you can somewhat unzip it. It doesn't completely come off, but you can kind of detach it a bit like a vest. So if you're maybe taller, if you have a larger upper body and have a hard time getting the bib tights on without kind of like pulling things up into the crotch and having some discomfort around the shoulder. You can kind of loosen that up a little bit, situate the shoulder straps, really get the bottom portion of the tights up into a good position. And then when you're done, you can kind of zip up around the waist when you have everything comfortable. So you're not trying to wrangle your way into a pair of bib tights. I haven't had to use it. I'm a little bit on the shorter side, but for some of you taller guys, you might find something like that technology to be helpful. Next up, there are shoe covers. These ones are just traditional Lycra shoe covers. They can also be used used as arrow covers to kind of cut some of the resistance that you get out of things like boa straps or Velcro straps. But you can also use these to kind of cut a little bit of the wind into the upper and the ventilated sole of your shoes. Still breathable enough, still lets some of the air through, but just blocks enough to make you a little bit warmer. So if you're kind of looking at some of those temperatures in the 50s, these could be helpful. I'm more likely to reach for something like this. These are a little bit warmer. These are neoprene shoe covers. These are made by Louis Garneau. These ones have a Velcro side. It makes them really easy to get on. Sometimes shoe covers are a real pain to get on, but the Velcro side lets you get your leg in there nice and easily. That way you can situate it around the cleat and the heel pretty adequately. Being neoprene, they're mostly waterproof. I wouldn't necessarily go out in the pouring rain and something like this. The water is going to make its way in between this Velcro panel here, and I think they would eventually wet out. But if it starts to rain a little bit or you've got some water on the ground and it's kind of spraying up with the front wheel into your feet, it's going to keep you more than dry and warm in those types of conditions. And then lastly, again, looking at socks. I might decide if I can't really decide if I need something like a fall tight and a winter tight, I might kind of split the difference and use the fall tights and maybe add in something like a knee high mid weight sock just to kind of give some extra protection to the lower leg. But just a variation on a traditional cycling sock. That way it gives me a little bit more warmth below the knee. Don't worry, nobody's going to see my fashion faux pas. I never wear these unless I'm wearing the long bib tights there. I guess I can throw them over my bib tights and look like a real clown, but I'm not going to do that. Just some 
something that I've used in my rotation here and there. Now let's move into the heavy hitters. This is going to cover the temperatures and the just sub freezing, maybe around 25 degrees to 45 degrees. Some of this equipment will go colder than that, but honestly, I don't really recommend riding much colder than 25 degrees. I really don't recommend riding sub freezing if you can avoid it. And if I am going to ride sub freezing, if I'm going to take maybe the fat bike out onto the trails, in that respect, I would probably just wear my skiing gear, maybe some snow pants, a nice winter shell jacket, my snowboarding helmet, things like that. But in terms of kind of training out on the roads, this is the type of gear I would use when it would be between that 25 and 45 degrees. So I'm gonna actually start with a pair of sunglasses. And winter is the only time of year that I look to one specific type of sunglasses. In this case, it is the Oakley Jawbreaker. I know there are other brands that have a similar model. The reason I look to these in particular is twofold. First, because the footprint over the face is more like a ski goggle. And it's going to cover the top of the cheekbone up over the brow. It just gives you more wind protection. The other reason is the ventilation. You'll see there's vents here at the top and vents at the bottom. And this comes in handy if I have something like a buff or a mask up underneath the nose of my glasses here. It's going to keep them from getting fogged up. And the moisture from your breath that fogs up your glasses seems fine until it's freezing cold and it starts to freeze on the lenses. And then you can't see anymore. And that could be very problematic. Then you have to pull your glasses off and then you have that kind of wind exposure in your eyes around the tops of your cheek and your brow. So being able to have a combination of good facial coverage as well as this ventilation keeps that fog from building up inside your glasses. And for those of you who wear traditional glasses, you know from all of 2020 having to wear a mask all the time, the struggle is real. Things get fogged up and it's really annoying. It gets more annoying when it's freezing cold. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you guys is something that's kind of an underrated piece of equipment here, and that is a helmet cover. I don't see a lot of people using these, but they're actually very effective. And the idea is just to cover the vents of your helmet. Vents are great until it's too cold to want your head ventilated. And as opposed to putting on something like an aero helmet, you can just use your traditional road helmet, use a pretty inexpensive helmet cover. This one here in particular is made by Louis Garneau, and it's both waterproof and windproof. So it's just an extra measure to kind of keep some of that wind out from under your Head, even if you're wearing maybe a helmet liner underneath, it just pulls a little of that extra cold air out of the mix. And of course, being waterproof in case it does start to sprinkle or rain a little bit, you can keep your head as warm as possible. It's pretty easy to put on your helmet. It'll fit most standard road and mountain bike helmets. It just kind of has an elastic band around the base that dips underneath the features of the helmet and it works very well. Next up, this is one of my favorite pieces for winter as I replace the buff when it goes from kind of midweight to heavyweight season is a balaclava. And this is my favorite balaclava. This is made by Cyrus and it's a fleece kind of hat and neck gaiter. And then it has this neoprene mask on it. But the cool part about the neoprene mask is that it's magnetic. So that way I can kind of dip it down under my chin if I need to go into the store or if I'm just building up a little bit too much heat, maybe I'm going uphill. And then when I'm ready to put the mask back on, it just locks back into place with the magnet. It's a great little piece of kit. I don't use this just for cycling. I also use it for running, walking, skiing. It's one of my favorite pieces of gear. I get a lot of great use out of this in the winter time. Next up, we have gloves. We're not joking around with gloves come winter time here. These are the lobster gloves. And the reason I would recommend a lobster glove for winter riding, because most of you know the difference between mittens and full fingered gloves is mittens are much more effective at keeping the fingers close together and maintaining heat between them. Well, this kind of splits the difference and gives you a little bit of that dexterity you might need to shift and still grip the handlebars. So you're not trying to mash it with just one big mitten. It allows you to basically have that type of dexterity. It takes a little bit of getting used to, I will admit that, but you have a little bit of mobility in the fingers and there, it's thin enough that you can can feel where the shifter is. Even something like DI2, I'm still able to kind of feel the difference between the shifters and make sure I can shift accordingly. They are also a winter shell type of glove. So they're both waterproof and windproof. They stay nice and warm. They also give you a little extra room if you wanted to throw something like a hand warmer in the top or in the bottom, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend it here if you're trying to grip the bars, but you can throw a hand warmer in there and add a little extra heat and insulation. It also has the double elastic here. So it's the elastic around your wrist. Plus you can kind of take this collar here, put it up around your jacket and then lock it in tight. So no wind is kind of sneaking in there and cooling off your hands. So lobster gloves are great. These ones are made by Giro. I think that this model is discontinued, but I'll try to find a replacement and put that down below. Next up is just a traditional shell jacket. I have a number of different jackets. I have this Castelli, I have a Castelli Gabba. I have a Pearl Azumi. This one happens to be my favorite because it's just the most versatile. I could use this in terms of my midweight collection as well and just use this with maybe a simple jersey underneath or maybe the mock turtle 
turtleneck underneath, but I put it in the winter collection because it always goes on top as that windbreaker layer. That's the real purpose of this jacket is to block the wind and there's enough room in this jacket for its size. Like this is a size small, but there's still enough room in here that I can layer underneath it. This is just basically the icing on the cake for my winter layers. If I do things well underneath, I can stay nice and warm. The coldest ride I've ever done with this jacket is 27 degrees and was able to keep my core nice and toasty with the proper layers underneath. There's really no major bells and whistles in technology here. It's just kind of typical windbreaker technology with a little bit of insulation there. Just a standard zip there, good quality zippers that have held up over the years. This does have pockets in it so you can keep your nutrition in there as well. Again, no real frills here. It's just a basic outer layer, outer shell, my favorite jacket to use in the winter time. Next up here, I will show you my two pairs of long tights. The first pair here is again by Gore. This is just a thicker version of what I had before. This has wind stopper technology, so it is windproof. It is also water resistant, so it just kind of takes the long tights that I use in my midweight collection and brings it up to colder temperatures and more winter appropriate temperatures. It has these zips here along the bottoms as well. That way you can kind of more adequately maybe put these on over a pair of thicker socks or a pair of boots, or even if you're feeling like they're a little bit too hot in the legs on a ride, you can kind of unzip these a little bit and vent yourself until you feel a little bit more comfortable. Again, it has a similar technology. You can see here that you can unzip the bib straps here and have it kind of like a free hanging vest. Once you have the tight situated, you throw these on and you can make those adjustments and zip this back on around your waist and you can put these on very well. They also have some accents of high visibility material as well as some reflective material, which can be really helpful during the winter time when people are not quite as diligent or aren't really expecting you to be on the road. These tend to stand out quite a bit. The other pair I want to show you is actually more of a traditional winter shell. And these are made by Pearl Izumi. And the reason that these are different is that they don't have a chamois built in. These are designed to go over your traditional cycling shorts or bib shorts. And what I like about that is the ability to kind of use these for a couple of days and remain hygienic. So you don't necessarily have to worry about washing these and getting them dried out by your next ride. You can wear these for a couple days unless you sweat a whole ton. And if you are sweating too much, these might be a little bit overkill for that weather. But these are both waterproof and windproof. So these are really kind of the heaviest weight material that I have. And wearing them over a traditional pair of bib shorts, I've been able to get these down to 27 degrees as well. The other feature that I really like about these is it doesn't have the zip at the bottom. They actually have almost kind of like a gator technology, if you will, where it has these two layers here. And you put this layer around your ankle and you hook it underneath your foot, slide it into your shoe. That way it's completely trapping the heat inside of the foot. So nothing is escaping with the wind. And then the top portion will go up and around maybe the top of your boot or your sock, whatever you're wearing in that case. So it really keeps you protected from any water or any wind that might be in your environment. So this is a really heavy duty pair of tights, but I love them and I think they're very effective. Getting into the home stretch, I have another pair of shoe covers. These are kind of my grand poobah shoe covers. They're kind of like wetsuits for your feet. These are kind of full neoprene. They are completely waterproof. The water is just going to kind of slide right off of these things. They trap heat inside. There's zero breathability and zero ventilation here. The point is to keep those feet warm and dry at all times. They have a zipper in the back. They also have this kind of Velcro cinch here to keep that zipper from creeping down. You know, as you start to flex the bottom of the foot, that zipper could start to pull down in a way. So this keeps it locked into place. And then inside of the zipper, it actually has these two neoprene panels that act sort of like a seam seal so that no water gets inside in case your feet are starting to get wet. Nothing's going to sneak in between the seams of the zipper there. So these are really my heaviest duty pair of shoe covers. And I don't use them a ton because they are very overkill for most of my outdoor riding. Next up, I have a pair of winter cycling boots. These are CD Gore-Tex boots. These do not screw around. If you've ever had Gore-Tex footwear, you know that Gore-Tex traps heat inside very well. Again, very low in terms of breathability. There are no vents on the bottom of these shoes that you will find in a lot of different road shoes. The idea is to keep your feet warm and dry. I actually wore these in the upper 40s at one point and my feet were actually hot. Even though for me, upper 40s is really cold. These happen to be overkill in that case. But these are the boots I took down to 27 degrees in conjunction with some shoe covers. They kept my feet nice and toasty. They have Velcros that make sure they seal in all the heat in the tongue that will work better than something like a boa. And it has a built-in gaiter at the top. Again, you kind of put that over the top of your sock, whatever other technology you use, make sure that nothing gets inside there. They also have carbon soles. These are not lightweight by any stretch of the imagination. The carbon is more there to simulate the same power transfer that you will find in a lot of your more expensive road cycling shoes. So these are going to be closer to what I use every day. So my mechanics don't change so that I feel like I'm getting the same type of power transfer. I really do like these a lot. I've had them for several years. You can see they 
they haven't taken a whole ton of wear and tear because I might only use them a handful of times per year. You basically invest once, my feet aren't growing anymore, so they will give me a number of years of good solid use. And then lastly, in conjunction with something like a boot is a ski sock. These are not cycling specific. These are just something I can use to add a little bit more warmth and insulation. Again, a knee high sock. If you're looking for ways to kind of save a few dollars, one of the best approaches that you can use is to utilize that skiing type of technology. There's a lot of read across potential, especially if you're looking for upper body insulation or the feet, the hands, the top tier moisture wicking technology, as well as insulation technology is used for things like skiing and snowboarding. If you have some of that equipment from those other sports, there's no reason you can't use it for cycling. They become very effective in that regard. But let me know in the comments down below what your favorite type of cold weather gear is. If you have any questions or comments about my gear, let me know. I'll try my best to engage with you guys more down there. Hit that thumbs up button if you got any value out of this video. Click those videos over there. Subscribe if you haven't already. All of the YouTube stuff. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. See you.